ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما all praise and glory be to Allah we thank him and we seek his help and his guidance and his pleasure and his forgiveness and we seek protection with Allah from the evil whispers within us and from the consequences of our evil deeds for whomever Allah guides none can ever lead astray and whomever Allah leads astray none can ever guide and we testify that no one is worthy of our worship and our devotion and our love and obedience in the absolute sense of those two words but Allah and Allah alone without any partners the true supreme king and the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was in truth his prophet and his servant and his messenger whom he sent as a mercy to the world o oh, you who have believed allah says o oh, you who have committed to faith have the taqwa of allah present in your life at all times and to the extent that he deserves or as best of that as you can muster and do not die do not get caught off guard by death except in a state of complete and total consistent loving surrender to Allah a state of Islam to begin welcoming my brothers and sisters to the house of Allah azza wa jal allow me to begin in a way that is a little bit atypical a little bit unordinary allow me to read to you the following line a writer says the children now love luxury and they have bad manners and they have contempt for authority and they show disrespect for elders and they love to chatter in place of exercise instead of doing work children are now tyrants not the servants of their household they no longer rise when elders enter the room they contradict their parents they speak in front of guests they chatter before company they gobble up dainties meaning appetizers at the table they cross their legs and they turn up tyrannize their teachers do you know who made this long list of complaints it was the famous philosopher socrates 2400 years ago though many of you would assume that this was said by someone complaining of generation millennials or generation y or or someone very recent and it is so interesting because this man is someone who specialized in studying the patterns of human thought and the fault lines of human thought the way humans think and yet still he could not see past the fact that he was blinded into thinking in his old age that the youth now are worse than ever just like everybody else does the youth this time they're crazy Subhanallah as Allah Azza wa Jalla said yu'ti al-hikmata man yasha Allah is the one that chooses who to give wisdom to he selects it subhanahu wa ta'ala and if Allah does not show you your blind spot the most intelligent person in the world can fall into some of the most amateur mistakes wa man lam yaj'al Allah lahu nuran fama lahu min nur whomever Allah does not grant a light to they will not have that light that light can never be made available to them and so part of the blessing of the hikma which of course starts with the revelation of the deen that is the foundation of all wisdom is that it enables you to break out of those dark corners <laughs> sometimes of your thought it allows you to break out of your box we all live in a box on some level to break out of your frame of reference where you can't see as acceptable anything but what you are a part of so like people say oh that's that old stuff we don't do that anymore or I, that's crazy that new age stuff is crazy i'm not accepting it cuz they're not a part of it or the people that say women women are crazy or the women that say men men are out of their minds 
Or the Western that says, these Eastern people, I don't know what they're thinking. Oh, and the Easterners say, these people in the West, A'udhu Billah, <laughs> in their own religious lingo. And likewise here, what I want to focus on for this khutbah, and perhaps a series of khutbah now, is the issue of the standoff by the elders against the youth and by the youth against the elders that Islam allows us to snap out of. Youth always say the elders are like stiff and they're stubborn and they're outdated and they're disposable essentially and they're not able to realize the value, the irreplaceable value of the elders and likewise the elders like Socrates by and large almost always fall into the state of frustration with the youth, they say these youth are reckless, these youth are dangerous, these youth are a threat, these youth are lazy, these youth, youth are hard-headed. We just got to <laughs> make sure. And they don't know how to understand them from a point of reference where they can benefit from them. Both ways, two-way street. And our Prophet wasallam even struck that balance in a very brief statement once when he said, لَيْسَ minna malam." They are not upon our teachings. They are not one of us, meaning aligned with us entirely. Those who do not revere their elders and have mercy on their youngsters and know the right of their scholars. You know, even in this country, when major changes happen, even in modern times, they still struggle on how to make sense of the youth. You know, in the 1940s, uh, when the, the concept of it takes a village to raise a child and the whole village life ended and then the extended family life went after it a, few, a century or two later, then which is how do we fix this problem? The youth are uh, needing to get reined in. They're going to destroy us. So in the 40s, the tactic was something that scholars describe as like dramatic scare tactics basically. Scared straight programs <laughs> to make sure we protect us and our civilization from the dangers of the youth. And then they realized that this didn't work. Among other reasons, it failed. And then in the 80s, they changed gears on the youth. And the major theories were, okay, we messed up. How do we do damage control now <laughs> on what the youth are going through? How do we stop them from failing so bad at school? Let's lower the standards, right? How do we stop them from getting into drug and alcohol abuse to the end of it? Let's figure this out. Let's give them some clemency with regards to their convictions. They started thinking of ways to do damage control. But then they realized you can't keep doing this. You can't be more and more and more lenient. That doesn't work either. And in the past 20 or 30 years, yeah, in the past 20 or 30 years from the 90s onwards, one of the most prevalent theories regarding the youth, though it still has major holes in it, is what they call the PYD theory, the Positive Youth Development Theory. And I know this is not ordinary talk for a khutbah, but I had to give this introduction like that so you realize just how complex the problem is to appreciate just how special the solutions Islam offers are. The PYD theory basically hinges on five points. It says youth will forever, they're saying now forget damage control, we have to like be ahead of the curve, we have to develop youth in a certain way, not look at them as evil or try to contain their evil or fix their problems and meet them halfway in their evil. So how do we develop them in a way we want? They said youth basically have five demands that they may not even know they have. They need five things whether they realize it or not. Okay? They call them the five C's. And I'm just going to use them as a framework for what Islam offers in light of this very human, very possibly flawed theory. The first of them, they say, the youth are, must have competence. Like, what's the point of caring about the youth if they're going to become irrelevant? They're going to have to have to contribute to society some way. They have to have some sort of skill. Then they said connection. The youth have to also see themselves as an extension of something. They have to see their roots. They have to be connected. They have to belong. Or else, even if they have a skill, we're not going to enjoy it at all. It's not going to benefit us in any way. They're, it's just going to be a free-for-all. Every man for himself. They said the third one they need, very important for them, is the concept of caring. They need to feel like, no matter how old they get, that they're cared about. They need to feel like they're cared about. Number four is confidence. And confidence is a little bit different than competence. Because you can be confident and not know what you're doing. Right? Like, let me run the show. That's the whole problem with youth. They believe they can do it all without the skills. 
But you can have the skills, but you are not very confident in your skills. So confidence is really about you giving youth a space to feel accomplished, even to fail a little bit and feel like I've actually done this. I've done this. So they develop resilience, they develop confidence. That was the fourth C, confidence. And the fifth of them is character. Nobody wants to hear anything from, you know, an intelligent, uh, disrespectful person, right? And nobody wants someone to be extremely good at making money, but they're extremely corrupt at the exact same time. No one wants someone that has a theory, but also they're not very sure about their theory on life, how life works, because then they're just going to be too fluid. They're not going to be stable. They're not going to be consistent. They need character. They need like a framework that they live their life by, like a life philosophy. So in light of those five, I do want to say a few things. We said <coughs> competence, connection, caring, confidence, uh, and the last of them, character, certainly will not be enough to uh, squeeze these into one khutbah. But the reason you do want to pay attention to these is because Islam paid attention to them. That's number one. We find them in the Quran and the Sunnah. And the way Islam addresses them is the number one thing you can offer the youth. And the youth don't just mean your children. You know, many people, they try to wait till their kids are youth to worry. No, the children you might have, or the children that look up to you in the masajid, all of that, the youth of this ummah. And secondarily, the youth of humanity. Because the greatest thing we can offer the next generation to meet Allah with, with a bright face, to leave this earth on the right foot, is to connect the next generation and more of them with the Islam that we have. And you see the struggle of Muslim American youth, by the way, in particular, that for so many reasons they conceal their Islam. They don't even show it, right? And when you conceal it for long enough, it becomes too difficult to conceal it, so you just quit doing it even in private. And this is especially difficult because Islam is, is the bad guy, is the scapegoat for everything that goes wrong in some spaces. The, the idea of Islamophobia is a reality. What is Islamophobia? The irrational fears that are created in society about Islam, that results in many things. The way these youth are looked at, they're stigmatized, they're looked at like second-class human beings almost in some people's eyes. It causes them to actually be bullied, causes them to be disadvantaged in work and, and in education before that. It's a reality. So much pressure on them. Aside from the fact that they're a minority, and that minority is 1% of the population, a disunited 1%, a scattered 1%. And so all of this adds up in a way that is extremely challenging. So we have to understand how to meet that challenge. And speaking of minorities, before I get into the five, the five aims of this development model, we can learn from the previous minorities in this country so much. Right? If, if you read about how the Italians faced what they faced when they came 100 years ago what the Jewish community faces due to their tiny numbers and the stigma that is out there about them, certainly. But there is no community that is worthier of being spoken about as an inspiration for Muslim American youth than the African American community. And this is not just because this is February and so it's Black History Month to the end of it, though that is always a good opportunity for you to realize what these people went through and did not just survive, but were able to thrive, to shine despite. Like the African-American community is also one-third of the Muslims in America. We don't realize that. But aside from their Islam, forget their Islam for a second. These people faced pressures and faced hate and developed while disadvantaged for 500 years. Since their arrival in this country, they faced these problems. This is not like the first generation Muslim or the second generation Muslim who's been here 20, 30 years. These people, even after slavery ended, the state had sanctioned certain laws, like it was called the Jim Crow laws. If you don't know what these are, there was state-sanctioned separation, segregation. They were placed in the most run-down places of, of society. Their communities were ghettoized, turned into ghettos. Drugs were subsidized. Families were broken. In light of all this, they still, 500 years and, and continuing, had in them the ability to not dissolve, to not melt with the pressure, to not be broken. And there's so much really we can learn from them. But let's begin with the five. Competence. To have skills. By Allah's grace 
everyone that goes through sta a standard upbringing in this part of the world is blessed to be able to develop a skill set. You need to find the skill set of the youth around you, whether your children or beyond, and to let them know they have a skill set. They are relevant. The world needs them or will need them. You know, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, he says when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died, me and a young man from the Ansar were standing and I said, let us go collect the sunan, the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while the senior sahaba are still plenty, before they all die off. And so my Ansari friend said to me, you think people will ever need you, o Ibn Abbas? He says, and I ignored what he said, and I continued to chase down all of the Sahaba and tell them exactly what did you hear from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, and I used to come to them at a time when I would have their undivided attention, at the noon time, when everyone would go into their homes because of the summer midday heat, and I would sleep at their door, and the sun would scorch me, and the dust would, the sand would cover my clothes. I would nap outside their door, so when they come out, they find me. And they say to me, what in the world are you doing here? If you needed us, call us. We would come to you. You're the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. This is wrong. He said, no, I wanted to come to you. You have something sacred. And he collected all of this knowledge until a time came when he was the ultimate reference point for this ummah. And the Ansari man used to pass by Ibn Abbas and see people crowded beyond wherever he was sitting, meaning an overflow outside the masjid, for example, and flowing into the alleyways in the streets. And he used to say, This young man was smarter than me. For us to instill in our youth that our skills, the ummah and the world needs. This is very important. You have an advantage. You have a special opportunity. No one else has. There are people that would die for this opportunity. Let them know what their relevance is. You know, speaking of the African-American community, I remember some of the lectures I used to hear uh, from Malik Shabazz, rahimahullah, Malcolm X, who I may wind up quoting a bunch of times in this khutbah. He used to say, and this is not a line we use, but the concept was very empowering, is the point. He used to say to his crowds in the, in the protests and in the, in the speeches, he would say to black people, look at you. You have the skin that these other people spend hours in the sun just to develop. You have it by birth. How do you think that would make them feel? People that were always told that you are inferior and your nose is wrong and your hair is wrong and everything about you is wrong. It would reinstate this in them. You have something that people need. People want. People cause themselves, cause themselves suffering to develop. One of the challenges towards helping our youth identify their skills is that we are very limited in the, what we think of skills. We're too idealistic. Not everyone is meant to be a doctor, as we say. Not everyone is meant to be an engineer. Not everyone is meant to be a hafiz. Not everyone is meant to be a sheikh. Not everyone is meant to be an expert in all the fields. And so sometimes our youth are so special, but because our standards are too high, we're too idealistic, we don't give them a chance to recognize how special they are. And be very careful of this. You know, even if, if the youth are masjid-going youth and that's it, sometimes our youth, alhamdulillah, come with us to the masajid. Do you realize what that means? 80% of Muslim Americans, youth and non-youth, don't attend the masajid. On the day of Eid, they're not here. So for your child or the youth that you see, however they may come, they show up and they're in the masjid, be content with that on some level and recognize that you are the key to helping others. You're relevant. You can bring people in the masjid. They'll never listen to me because I'm too busy or I have an accent or whatever it may be. Show them their relevance. Show them their skill set and don't demand that they develop a very specific skill, a very specific competency that may never be possible for them. That is the first of them, competence. They need to have skills, absolutely. Don't be idealistic about it and help them find it.
الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله The second major demand a youth development uh, screams for is the, the need for connection and the order is, is not deliberate to connect what does it mean to connect? They need to feel like they belong. They are part of something big, something bigger than themselves. You know, uh, Malcolm, rahimahullah, when he was gathering the people upon his call, he, though he gave up his racism when he found the real Islam, he still called people around the concept of their blackness, their ethnicity. He was a black nationalist, rahimahullah, and said only if we gather the momentum from all the people that were punished and persecuted because of their blackness, we gather all their grievances, can we actually make a difference? And he said, I used to be a black nationalist in the United States. No, this was in the end of his life, right before he was assassinated, rahimahullah. He used to say we need to call people from our background, from every part of the world, so we can prosecute the United States in the United Nations for their crimes against us. That does what? It made them feel like they are part of something huge. The reality is most Muslim American youth, they don't have a sense of identity or a sense of uh, connection belonging to anything outside of America. And it is not wrong to identify with being a part of America. This would be, it would be unnatural and unexpected for you to feel not part of this country and the fabric of this country. But the concept that I don't just belong to the United States in 2020 is very important. To believe that I am also a part of this planet, a part of this very blessed ummah that is all over the globe. You know, sometimes the reason why they don't identify publicly with Islam is because they've internalized this concept. They imagine that their Islam is what people accuse it of. It's like a little cult, a death cult of people that can't wait to die so they can get married to their prizes in paradise. And that's it. But you belong to a religion of 1.5 billion people. That sense of belonging is extremely important for them. You belong to a religion that spans 1,400 years. You know, as the poet, he used to say, Very beautiful line to think about. He says, and of what increased me, above all else, in honor and in nobility, to the point that I felt like I was walking on the stars, for me to be included under your statement, O oh my servant, that I'm the servant of God. That is my greatest identity. I belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the creator, not his creation. No part of his creation. I belong to the creator above all else, that I was included under your statement, O oh my servant, and that you sent Muhammad above all else, not anyone else, as my prophet. I got to be a part of the last ummah, the one that Allah saved. He saved the best for last. And I get to be a part of it. You know, Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu, when he was traveling through uh, the provinces as Khalifa, and he got to Al Jabiyah, where Abu Ubaid, radiallahu anhu, was the, uh, was the governor, he told him, Let us go to your house. And he said, Of course, it's an honor. Go to my house. And so he took him home, and Umar wanted to go to his house for a very specific reason. Umar said to him, Take me to your home. When they entered, his wife came out. The wife of Abu Ubaidah. He said, Fulana, you're so and so. She said, Yes. I'm going to make you sorry. So she caught everybody off guard. Like, Umar had heard that this woman would lean on her husband to take advantage of his position. And he wanted to make sure she would not do that. That this was a responsibility, not a privilege. This role. And so he said, I'm going to make you sorry. So she said to him, you will not be able to. So he said to her, be sure I will make you sorry. So she said, you will not be able to make me sorry. And so her husband stepped in like, this is Umar. If Umar can't make you sorry, who's going to be able to make you sorry? And this is when he's Khalifa too, so it's a no-brainer. So he said, uh, no, he can make you sorry, like back down. She said, Wallahi la yaqdir. Wallahi, he'll never be able to. And then she explained why she says that. She said, 
أيقدر أن ينزع عني الإسلام فيذهب به Will he be able to strip me of my Islam and send it elsewhere? So Umar said no. She said, فلا أبالي ما يفعل بعد ذلك. Then I don't really care what he can do to me after that. So Umar رضي الله عنه said, استغفر الله. This is clearly not the woman that was related to me. Different woman. Different personality than that. He said, I ask Allah's forgiveness. And he, mission completed. He left. رضي الله تعالى عنه. And so belonging to a great ummah is a part of it. Belonging to a great history. Like the history of this ummah, take your pick, whoever you want. Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, the humongous personality, historical personality. Like were it not for the fact that the enemies of Salahuddin in the books of Europeans spoke about how impressive and how gracious he was when he took back Jerusalem, we wouldn't even believe it. We'd say that our scholars, our historians are making this stuff up. They adored the man for like his exemplar character. It was a historic event. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, if you go to this scholarship, Ibn Taymiyyah, you are connected with this, with this heritage. You know, they say there was never a greater scholar since Aristotle in philosophy than Immanuel Kant. And now, many Western scholars, because they're just finally getting past their prejudice and discovering some of the scholarship of the East, Muslim world included, they realize that so many of the groundbreaking ideas that haven't come about in 2,000 years that were brought by Immanuel Kant were said by Ibn Taymiyyah five, six hundred years before that. Rahimahullah ta'ala. When you speak about the civilization of Muslim Spain and Al-Andalus and otherwise, one man, a young youth, walked in on two feet without an army and conquered southern Spain. Abdul Rahman al-Dakhir rahimahullah. When you connect people to this, it's a completely different experience. Connect them to their history, connect them to their roots. You know, I will share with you two things before I close. Uh, connecting them with adulthood even, within the family. So I said Islam, and I said the Ummah, the greats of the Ummah. Connecting them even with family. Number one, family studies continue to show. Family has the greatest influence over everything else, over media, over schooling, over everything else on the transmission of faith. And youth look to connect in general with adulthood. And that is why, subhanAllah, there's a study I was uh, going through recently, two weeks ago. There's a, a very formidable study that came out of Harvard University to show you how detrimental it is to have broken families, the absence of fathers in particular. This study showed that the African-American families, I have to come back to these examples, subhanAllah, have... It hurts everybody, but they have the most mitigation, meaning the least damage to their families by the absence of the father. Why? Because they usually have other males present. They are more likely to have the grandfather present, right? This helps the youth connect. I'm part of the big people now, right? I'm part of the adults now. I've been accepted. That sense of acceptance is huge. You know, the studies also extend to a long 10-year study about all the gangs that used to arise, especially in the 90s in Los Angeles. All of them continue to have the same trend, the prevalence of fatherless homes, right? And they would say we felt more acceptance in gang life than we've ever felt at home. So that idea of keeping the family and the wider family in the masajid as the stronghold, bolstering that is huge. I want to feel this transition that I am an adult. I'm an equal. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, and time is up, so I will defer it to next week actually. We ask Allah azza wa to help us with this monumental task. Appreciate our Islam and protect our youth. Help us serve and respond to their silent demands. Allahumma ameen. May Allah grant us and them life and health and safety. And make them and us pleasing to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ahdi shabab al-muslimina aamma. Walhadirina minhum khassa. اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد